Okay, members. Members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And before I call John Blair to ask the first question, could I remind members that there has been an increasing uh, length of time taken by members in recent weeks to ask their question. So can I ask members to put their speeches away, turn their laptops off and ask the questions as quickly and succinctly as you possibly can do. You are taking time off other members. On the downside of it, it is taking time off other members' ability to ask questions, and many of them are your own party colleagues. So I say I would ask people to keep your questions as short and succinct as possible. So, John Blair, give Question a good example. One, With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I wish to group questions one, six, and seven together, and I am acutely aware of the labour uh, problems facing our meat processing sector, the growing shortages, particularly in relation to the number of slaughter plant operatives and butchers in our abattoirs and processing plants. I have been engaging extensively and held numerous meetings with stakeholders from across our food processing sector about their concerns and how best to resolve the issue. Despite employers offering competitive wages and other incentives, they have struggled to recruit all the workers they need because insufficient um, appetite exists amongst our domestic workforce for these types of jobs. For a significant period of time, we have relied on migrant workers to fill the labour gap in the agri-food industry. Stakeholders, however, have indicated that the new UK immigration system has removed a previously existing route to fill vacancies. The new system, while offering a route to fill skilled vacancy, is cumbersome, and firms report that it is extremely difficult for them to identify migrants who meet all elements of the eligibility criteria and have identified the English language requirement as a particular barrier to entry. I am obviously very concerned about this situation and am committed to doing what I can. As you know, immigration policy is a reserved matter. So my focus has been ongoing communication with the top levels of government in Whitehall. I have written to the Prime Minister, Home Secretary and George Eustace to highlight the severity of the problem in the hope that we can remedy the situation as quickly as possible. We have seen some movement in the recent announcement on additional temporary visas for HGV drivers and poultry workers, but it is not enough, and I will keep pressing for more. John Blair, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for the detail of that reply. Can I ask, given the contact with senior officials in Whitehall, if there any request has been made for an extension to or a review of the previous EU settlement scheme and the timeframes around that, and whether all of that is worth revisiting? Well, in terms of it, um, from my perspective, as someone who was a supporter of Brexit, um, I, I, I wanted to see an end um, to the open door policy in terms of immigration, uh, but we should be in a position where we can uh, bring people in where we need them, and we certainly need them in the food industry. And that is the point that I have been making repeatedly um, to uh, the UK government. Here, indicating yes, there is a lot of people at a local level who are still unemployed, and we wish to have them in employment. And this is well-paid employment, so, so we would wish to have them there. Um, again, I will point out to them that these are skilled jobs, and therefore you cannot just lift someone out of unemployment straight into a job like butchery or indeed HGV driving. Um, there has to be training involved and, and considerable training in some instances, uh, which will take um, years. Uh, so I do think that it does need to be re re looked at yet again uh, by Whitehall. Call Melissa McHugh. But, uh, uh, and I'm sure, Minister, uh, you probably won't agree with me, but this is as a result of Brexit at the end of the day. And uh, I ask you that what pressure will you bring to bear on the British government uh, to ensure that EU workers in particular can come here to the north of Ireland and work and live and help to rescue the impending uh, crisis that exists now in the uh, food agri sector? I had thought that uh, a gentleman. Who, who lives so close to the border would actually know what is going on um, just across it. Uh, because the IFA Pigs Chairman Roy Galley says the Irish pigs meat sector is under extreme pressure due to the lack of suitable labour availability at processing level and on pig farms. Um, on vets, the topic of, of the shortage of large animal vets was raised by the Veterinary Ireland President on the back of concern recently expressed by the Joint Directors Committee on agricultural food and the marine. Um, Paul Brophy, who is one of the largest um, producers of vegetables in Ireland, says one of the country's largest broccoli growers described labour issues in the sector as chronic and said it will be unwinding of the industry if it is not addressed. So the member may have some uh, glowing uh, report that nobody else knows about of how good things are in the European Union on this issue. This is an issue that has been piling up within the European Union. 
as well as, uh, as the United Kingdom, we are actually in a better position to respond because we can actually go out to places like the Philippines and others, other countries where there is an available workforce. We just need an adjustment in government policy to do it. The Irish government are stuck with EU rules, uh, which thankfully we don't have. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, unfortunately, skills shortages um, in the sector were entirely predictable. Um, with EU workers leaving and going back to their homeland. So what I'm asking the Minister is what preparations have you made in order to ensure that a pipeline of skills were available to these industries and have you discussed apprenticeships and traineeships in order to fill the gap left by our European friends that have left this country because they're no longer welcome? Thank you. Well, I, I really do have to pull the member into line for that last comment. Who says EU workers aren't welcome in Northern Ireland? They left here because they weren't welcome. They've been here for many years. They have been here for many years, and were very welcome to continue to stay in Northern Ireland. What people who supported Brexit voted for was that we wouldn't have uncontrolled immigration. And perhaps the member wants uncontrolled immigration because that keeps people's pay down, and that ensures that people work on minimum wage. And I'm glad to see lorry drivers, digger drivers, and indeed uh, people who work in meat plants um, getting an uplift in their pays because they work hard and they deserve to be well paid for the pro work that they do. So I welcome those aspects that Brexit has delivered, which is higher pay for lo lower paid workers, and perhaps the SDLP would catch on that that is a good thing for the community. Call Roy Beggs. Mr. Speaker, um, <coughs> the, the shortage of skilled labour. Uh, is creating a potential welfare difficulty for, in terms of animal welfare. Can the Minister advise if he has been made aware of any concerns, particularly from our pig and poultry farmers who have limited space capacity? How urgent is this situation and how is it going to be addressed in the short term and the long term? And has he been in touch with the uh, Minister for the Economy? I think it is extremely urgent and we have engaged extensively with the industry and we have um, are actively looking at, at, at our options. Some of the options is to actually um, slaughter pigs at birth, uh, so that uh, this, this backlog that is building up um, isn't something that, that, that continues uh, unabated. Um, another one is to slaughter animals on farm at some stage, uh, but that doesn't particularly deal with the instantaneous problem because we have a backup now. And one of the other areas that we could look at is, is putting pigs into cold storage, um, because the, the problem isn't the capacity for slaughter, the problem is the capacity for butchery. Um, now, the companies would have to want to do that, uh, but we're open to, to suggestions um, coming from the industry. I believe that the industry are the people best place um, to go forward with solutions, and we will work closely with the industry in trying to achieve solutions. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses uh, thus far. In relation to uh, the previous members mentioned pigs on farm, I had a pig producer last night, and his concern is that uh, as the weeks go by, he's, his pigs are backing up on farm, and he has difficulty in relation to that. Uh, the Minister, the members, there are, the Minister agree with me. There's members in this house blames Brexit, but the Republic of Ireland has the very same problem, and they're still in the European Union. Well, as I indicated to Mr McHugh, um, and clearly Ms McLaughlin didn't, didn't take it in, uh, but I indicated what the farming community is saying down there, what the veterinary community is saying down there, there is a shortage of key workers. And a lot of this um, would actually have to do with EU policy, in that you can only bring people from the European Union. And you know, we, we, we had this with, with um, health many years ago and still have, where we used to have many doctors come from India and, and from Malaysia and countries like that there, and we couldn't get them, uh, uh, and we had to close um, units and hospitals because of a lack of doctors. And the same applies to, to this. So workers are out there. They're in the world. We can bring them in. Um, what I'm saying to the UK government is that we're not looking for tens of thousands here. We're looking for thousands, is a relatively small number. Uh, it will not uh, throw uh, immigration out of control, but it will ensure that food, which is on our farms, can be delivered uh, to the local people uh, right across uh, the United Kingdom. Well, Matthew Hill. Mr Speaker, uh, Minister, in January of this year, uh, 
you tweeted to Aaron Banks, uh, one of the main drivers behind the Leave.EU movement, to thank him for all that he had done to make Brexit happen. Minister, Leave.EU uh, notoriously put up a poster uh, with, uh, saying breaking point with hundreds of thousands of migrants in front of them. What about Brexit did you think wasn't about ending migration? And would you like to apologise to those suffering from a labour crisis in this country? Well, what, what, what is very clear is we had uncontrolled immigration and I have no problem with immigration uh, and I have no problem uh, with bringing people in who we actually need. Uncontrolled immigration is an entirely different thing and uh, I welcome that that uh, is no longer the case. I welcome the fact that our workers now are better paid, they are on the lower end of the scale and if the member is not aware that lorry drivers Digger drivers, uh, people who are working in food factories, all have had significant wage uplifts, then the member isn't living in the real world because the rest of us do know about it. And I welcome the fact that low paid workers have got their pay increased since we left the European Union, and that is part of the policy of not having uncontrolled immigration, where we have everybody working um, in, 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 in those types of, of jobs uh, at minimum wage, which was an unacceptable situation. And I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll group questions two and eleven together. I firmly believe that where persons have been convicted of animal cruelty offences and banned by courts from keeping animals, all actions that can reasonably be undertaken to reduce the risk of reoffending should be pursued. And as such, I welcome the recent public petition on the potential for an animal cruelty, cruelty register. I'm keen to explore how such a register would operate in Northern Ireland. I have already engaged with the Minister for Justice on this topic, and my officials have been liaising with their counterparts in her department. Officials have also been reviewing the effectiveness and impact of the similar types of registers available in already in operation elsewhere. Over the last number of months, significant progress has been made identifying the key issues that need to be addressed. Were such a register to be implemented and maintained here in Northern Ireland, these issues include compliance with data protection legislation and the appropriate disclosure of or access to conviction data. I have requested that my officials take these efforts forward and develop proposals on potential next steps before the end of this year. Supplementary, Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, obviously, this is a very important subject, this animal cruelty uh, register, and I would like to see that come into operation. Could, would the Minister like to expand on any conversations he has had with the Minister of Justice and uh, tell us any more about any issues that have arisen through those conversations? Well, obviously, we have a correspondence. We've also had uh, verbal um, communication in, in meetings um, on this issue. And uh, I think it is an important issue um, that, that we actually progress and move forward on. I, I don't quite get uh, all of the issues around the data in that uh, most of these offences are pub published because they've been through court and they're already in the public domain. Um, so I'm not so sure. Uh, that we need just to be as cautious when it comes to the whole data protection element. Um, because if it's already in the public domain, uh, what, what are we protecting the individuals from? And ultimately, individuals who have been found guilty of cruelty to animals, you know, we, we, we need to ensure that they don't have the opportunity to do it again. Uh, and th therefore, in my view, um, the more people are aware of it, the, the, the better. Uh, but I would encourage people to question the Department of Justice on this issue as well. Um, we are very keen to move it forward. Uh, I believe that we can get there. It will not be in the lifetime of this Assembly, uh, but nonetheless I believe that we will get there because I believe it is something which the public would actually want, the public would desire, and I believe it is something that this House would desire. John Bundy. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I am grateful to the Minister for, for that answer. Um, obviously this is a serious issue and of concern to many in Northern Ireland. The problem is, of course, as the Minister outlines, if a sentence is not, if somebody is given a sense of not being allowed to keep an animal, and there's no means to implement or enforce that, then that sentence becomes immaterial. Um, and I'm aware of the Minister's response to Mrs. Kelly from a couple of weeks ago that something of the delay was in DOJ. On that basis, would the Minister outline uh, the impact of the delay on progressing this issue and what may be done to address the impasse between the two departments? Well, certainly, this issue has been raised to me in the earlier part of the Assembly, so it is something that I have been preferred to move forward on. 
um, but we haven't been, been able to do that um, just as yet. Um, I think there appears to be considerable issues um, within the Department of Justice um, and concerns about how we can handle the whole, the whole data, uh, how we can engage in, in compliance uh, with existing procedures. Uh, personally, I think all of these things um, we can overcome and therefore move forward on. And uh, I would hope that before we get to the end of this term, the Department of Justice will be in a position uh, when a new minister comes in uh, to be able to give that minister uh, the room uh, to move this uh, forward in conjunction with the future dear minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm aware of the minister's commitment to delivering on the uh, animal cruelty register, but it has. And the, the petition had an All Ireland uh, dimension, and of course the obnoxious puppy farms, you know, come from Scotland and elsewhere as well in terms of the, the animals sold. Uh, so I wonder, Minister, have you had uh, an opportunity yet to discuss uh, a shared register not only with the South of Ireland but also with uh, England, Scotland, Wales? Well, I think we need to get over the first hurdle, and, and that, 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 that's, that's what we do here. Uh, but I, I have no uh, problem whatsoever uh, in sharing information uh, with colleagues in any of the jurisdictions that the member mentioned. Um, it makes logical sense. Um, I do know that uh, Mr. Newton uh, has a private member's bill, uh, which would outlaw um, the, those large-scale puppy farms and, 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 and people who, who produce the, the animals purely for profit. And uh, that is something which I am supportive of. And I would hope that this assembly would be supportive of and will facilitate the delivery of that piece of legislation um, going through this House over the course of the next number of months. It really is one of the private members' bills that, in my mind, um, stands out uh, in terms of its importance, in terms of what it can deliver, and uh, will leave a good mark for this assembly uh, as it comes to its closure. And I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Further um, to Ms Kelly's um, question, does the Minister agree that an all-island animal cruelty register would be the most effective way of preventing repeat offenders that have already been convicted in one of the, one of the jurisdictions, but not both? Well, I do, I do recognise um, that the people who engage in animal cruelty you know, can be very fluid, and therefore they can move. So, uh, Getting a, a register established, established in the first instance, I think, would be very positive, and the ability to share that register with others, I think, would also be a positive move, um, whether that be on, on this island or whether it be um, on the entirety of these islands. Call Rosemary Barden. Minister, thank you for your answer so far. You spoke about compliance with data protection and your register. You wanted the register to share with others. Are you indicating then that this register would be open for the public to, available to the public if they wanted to buy a puppy to check if we're buying it from an appropriate source or not? Um, I think that needs, needs further thought. It certainly should be available to dog wardens and people who look after the compliance of the well-being uh, of animals. Um, so, uh, veterinary services, um, dog wardens, police, and, and, and other bodies certainly sh should, should have an availability to it. Uh, whether it's made um, totally available to the public would not entirely be in my hands. Um, that again would be a consideration uh, in discussions with the Department of Justice. Um, but I do see merit in it. Moving on, I call Steve Egan. Uh, Question number three, please. But can I reiterate that the protocol is unacceptable and unworkable? This was recognised in this House yesterday, even by those who wanted rigorous implementation of the protocol previously. The movement of pedigree cattle is yet another example of how the protocol is disadvantaging Northern Ireland farmers. The movement of livestock, including pedigree cattle, from Northern Ireland to Great Britain for agriculture shows, sales or exhibitions is a long-standing tradition for local farmers and breeders and provides an opportunity to access markets and to demonstrate the quality of our specimens and bloodlines, which are internationally recognised as excellent. Additional animal health requirements as subscribed to the European Union legislation in the Northern Ireland Protocol have been applicable since 1 January 2021 for Northern Ireland livestock returning to Northern Ireland following a temporary movement to Great Britain. Since then, it appears that cattle movements for breeding and production purposes from Great Britain to Northern Ireland from January to September have decreased by about a third when compared with 2020, 
which may well be related to those new animal health requirements, such as the residency period. I am completely opposed to any additional requirements for re-entry of livestock to Northern Ireland from Great Britain under the Northern Ireland Protocol, and firmly believe these place our farmers and breeders, including pedigree breeders, in a disadvantaged position while negatively affecting their livelihood and business. For this reason, I have already written on a number of occasions to Mara Sefkovic, the Vice President of the European Union, and George Eustace, the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, to highlight the burden these new requirements impose on our local industry. I continue to make representations to the EU Commission and the UK Government, urging them to find long-term sensible solutions that take into account what is the actual biosecurity risk to the EU single market and the position of Northern Ireland as an integral part of the UK. I also recently took the opportunity to once again stress the difficulties the Northern Ireland Protocol is having on our livestock breeding sector when I met George Eustace and Lord Frost at the Ballinborough Show. My officials continue to engage with EU officials and their counterparts in DEFRA in order to seek a solution. Thank you very much. And may I thank the Minister for, Minister for his remarks so far. Minister, what you have described to me sounds very much indeed like a diversion of trade. Could the Minister explain how this could be possibly seen by anybody in this House as the best of both worlds? Uh, I can't see how it's, how it's the best of both worlds. I, I see how we could have the best of both worlds, um, but this isn't it, and it can't be it, and it won't be it. And therefore, you know, I would encourage colleagues um, from the other side of the House um, to recognise this and to start working for the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland, irrespective of their views of, on, on, on Brexit. We are now in the circumstance that we are in today. The protocol is what applies. And the protocol is causing misery to this sector and a whole series of other sectors. If the minister is unable to do anything about this other than make representations, doesn't it demonstrate both the tyranny of the protocol and his folly in respect of something he could do something about, namely continuing to implement the checks? Which keep the iniquitous protocol alive. Well, the member talks about folly, and the member has also, for quite a number of years, um, decried this particular house and the Northern Ireland executive. And if we do away with this house and the Northern Ireland executive, we then take our executive authority from Westminster. And I would remember, I would remind the member, I would remind the member. Remind the member that this is Westminster policy, not Northern Ireland executive policy. This is Westminster policy, which has been imposed upon Northern Ireland. And the member knows this very well because the member tested it in court and he lost his case. And I, I would also remind the member that we are not going to win this battle by going in the streets, by violence or anything else. We will win this battle by good politics. And that's what I've engaged in, good politics. And if we win this battle, it will be through quality of politics, not from people shouting and carping from the sidelines. Well, Daglan, um, well, but the Minister will be aware that this has come about because of Britain diverging away from EU regulations and rules. Would he agree that the best way to resolve the situation and get the best of both worlds is for a veterinary agreement that will, that will align the UK and the EU? Well, again, uh, the, the member seems to um, just whitewash what is actual fact. The protocol was to be about protecting the single market. So perhaps the member, um, when he has the opportunity at another time in his own street, because he won't have now, but I'll pose the question, can enlighten us as to what danger this causes to the European Union single market for a breeder to take a bull or a heifer to Scotland to sell, and if it doesn't sell, to bring it back home again and sell it in the Northern Ireland market. Because maybe the member is not aware of sure, the Agricultural Committee, but our animals are tagged at birth. And they're followed right through. And in fact, we have a situation now as a result of the protocol where animals come from Britain to Northern Ireland have their tags removed. Which is absolutely ridiculous situation where you have animals which have had the same tag from birth <coughs> and the protocol demands that they're actually removed in the name of protecting the single market. I never heard anything so ridiculous. 
I'll pass my clone. Uh, could I ask the, the Minister for his opinion of Lord Frost, um, who is currently attacking what Lord Frost negotiated months after Lord Frost praised what Lord Frost negotiated? That is the protocol. Um, well, commend, commend the fellow, uh, or, 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 or Mr. McLoone, I should say, on, on getting the name right today, because yesterday was, was, was some fellow, I think it was. So, so I, I commend you. It's, it's always good to, to be respectful and courteous about people, even when you disagree with their point of view. I have uh, engaged with Lord Frost on a number of occasions, and I hope that Lord Frost um, was taken uh, the issues that I have raised with him on board, and that he will make those recommendations which will actually uh, lead us to a much better circumstance than we are currently in. So the command paper, I believe, was a significant demonstration that the UK government um, were getting the arguments that the DUP in the main, not alone, but in the main, were putting onto the table of our government, UK government. And I trust that that command paper will be followed through into actions which will lead to us being in a circumstance where we don't have these trade barriers. Because when you put a barrier between um, where 65 per cent of your imports come from, that's not really a very logical thing to do. And for the members across, across the, the, the House who, who called out for this, and then for that to be rigorously implemented, um, I think I can understand that they feel a little foolish at this point. Call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, and thank the Minister so far for his answers. Minister, obviously you referred to the, the member previously regarding pedigree uh, transfers across the Irish Sea. What department and issues in your department are you receiving regarding the sheep imports and movements of sheep? Obviously, there's a lot of uh, sales at the moment in Northern England and Scotland, and obviously the issues that occur. My vets have been engaging extensively on this issue, and we would have been hopeful of getting a resolution um, by now on it. And you know, in terms of veterinary, um, I believe that there is a, a resolution on the table, and it is now up to politicians to decide to go with it. Uh, but the impact that it's had is that 97% of the imports um, that, 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 that had happened previously aren't happening. So we have only 3% of the sheep coming in now. Uh, that we had uh, previous to the protocol, and uh, that is having a severe impact uh, on areas like the Glens of Antrim and the Sperrins, uh, who rely heavily on the importation of high-quality Scottish blackface sheep. They also sell Scotland their high-quality blackface sheep, but given the, the, the numbers that are involved, uh, it is important for that exchange of bloodlines to take place to ensure uh, that they can maintain uh, the quality that has been established. I call Kelly Armstrong and you are not likely to get a supplementary. Question number four. There is currently a shortage of vets within my department more widely in both the public and private sectors across all of the United Kingdom. There is also <coughs> increasing acceptance that Northern Ireland requires a more assured supply of veterinarians in the long term than is available from historical sources. There are a number of options for achieving this which merit further exploration. And I have therefore commissioned a formal assessment of the need for vets in Northern Ireland and an independent analysis of the various options for meeting this need. In the case of my own department's veterinary requirements, my officials are currently exploring all available avenues, including taking on more permanent veterinary staff through the NICES recruitment and temporary vets through the agencies on the NICES agency framework. Officials are also investigating contracting the supply of vets with providers of veterinary services with the assistance of the Department's Finance, Construction and Procurement Division. In the meantime, my priority is ensuring we have sufficient vets to carry out the vital work in our meat processing plants and on field offices, delivering TB eradication, providing support to the agri-food industry and assuring the welfare of animals. The use of scarce veterinary resource to oversee intra-UK trade at Northern Ireland points of entry is unacceptable and unnecessary, just as the Northern Ireland Protocol in its current form is unacceptable. And given the absence of material risk to the European Union's single market, since in so many respects the standards in the UK single market equal, if not exceed, those in many parts of the European Union, the protocol is already unworkable and becoming unsuitable as the number of checks rise uh, to a possible 25,000 per week under its full implementation, rigorous implementation, 
rather than spending scarce resource checking goods, which will all probably never come near the EU single market and with no material risk um, if they should. It would be much more preferable that our vets focus on the real priorities facing the Northern Ireland agri-food industry and on animal welfare and of concern to the population. And members, that ends the period for a list of questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Questions 1, 3, 4 and 8 have been withdrawn and I call Ms Liz Kimmins. Can I ask the Minister for an update on progress to ensure the North is included in an All-Ireland PGA status for Irish grass-fed cattle? Well, there's a piece of work done on that and uh, we have had requested that that would be the case. And, uh, Therefore, it was a bit disappointing whenever uh, the Irish government proceeded um, on their own. Uh, so, subsequent to that, we have been pressing uh, for our inclusion. Uh, there was one particular issue uh, which they uh, believed that we were behind on, and uh, it was something that uh, we, we, we uh, believe that can quite easily uh, be caught up. And uh, also, I think that the EU would probably be accepting of that as well. Liz Kimmins. I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, the protection provided by the protocol is vital to our inclusion in an All Ireland PGI for Irish grass fed cattle. Does the Minister therefore accept that it is vital that we continue to apply EU standards and regulations in maintaining high quality produce, which allows it to be considered an initiative such as the All Ireland PGI uh, status for grass fed cattle? Well, I'd also be looking to the PGI British status as well, and um, perfectly honest, um, because I want to maximise the opportunities uh, for no one out of beef producers. And uh, if you uh, were a beef farmer in the Irish Republic now, you'd be quite envious of the prices that uh, beef farmers in Northern Ireland are receiving for their beef, which is significantly uplifted um, since we left the European Union, I might add. And uh, the main market, of course, is the United Kingdom uh, for our beef. Uh, so. We are in a reasonably good position uh, in terms of uh, beef sales, uh, but I want to have us in the best position possible um, right across the world. Uh, so any marketing opportunity that comes available to me is a marketing opportunity that I would be keen to uptake. I call Erlia Flynn. Uh, can, call you. Um, can the Minister outline what role his department has identified for carbon capture and storage technology um, in the fight against climate change here locally? Yeah, there is uh, extensive work being done on that. Um, peatland strategy is one area that we are looking at. Um, there are two issues around our peatlands um, that aren't uh, in as good a condition as they should be. And, and when I say that, um, our peatlands are in a better condition. Uh, than uh, other parts of uh, Ireland, indeed Scotland, um, and, and other parts of the UK. So um, we do need to improve our peatlands um, to get them to that optimum uh, status. And the two things are the wetting of them and reducing the nitrogen deposition that takes place. Uh, on the nitrogen deposition, uh, we had hoped to um, reduce the amount of ammonia uh, in the environment uh, by around 25 per cent, indeed around 35 per cent, um, where those peatlands are, are, are stressed. And uh, obviously, uh, moving to a, a, a new payment system uh, will assist us uh, in working with the farming community uh, in areas around the peatlands and in, in wetting them. Supplementary, Olivia Flynn. Thank you, and thank, uh, thanks to the minister for the response. Um, he is probably already aware that the Climate Change Commission expressed its intention for carbon capture and storage to form a major part of Britain's emissions reduction strategy, <clears throat> yet the Commission have indicated that it is not due to operate here in any significant manner. Um, so can the Minister tell us what interventions and supports his department intend to offer in the absence of CCS technology to reduce uh, emissions in the fight against climate change? Okay, well, there's, there's, there's the capture of emissions, there's reduction of emissions, and the capture of emissions we have our peatlands, uh, we have our forests, and we have our, our, our grasslands. And um, I want to do a course of work, uh, or we are doing a course of work through AFDE and Chuggis, um on our grasslands uh, to identify what capture takes place there, um, particularly older grasses and, and the roots um, as they uh, go further into the soil, um, how much carbon they are taking from, from the atmosphere. In terms of uh, the reduction of carbon, I believe that there are so many opportunities that exist. So. 16% of our carbon production comes from households, 27% comes from agriculture, 
um, we can do a lot to capture um, emissions uh, which are going into the environment from agriculture um, and translate them into uh, renewable heat, um, renewable gas uh, to go into people's homes uh, and therefore lead to a situation where we have a win-win circumstance. Uh, but that will involve us uh, not just maintaining the food production at its current levels, probably increasing that, um, capturing um, a lot of the nutrients that come from that and using those nutrients uh, for environmental purposes. Minister, um, I appreciate your future uh, agriculture policies there for consultation, and uh, you can't preempt that in any way. Why might you be in a better position to give farmers some clarity uh, for the time ahead in terms of particularly in relation to the future of the entitlements which they currently hold? Um, for me, a lot of the entitlements uh, were based upon farming activity between I think it was 2003 and 5 or 2005 and 7 and around that period. Um, I think that we probably will have a new policy in 2022-2023. So entitlements should be around activity now, not in something which you know had happened 18, 20 years previous. Supplementary, Dagla Magalier. Thank you, Minister. You partially answered me, me secondary, me supplementary question. So, uh, would you anticipate that your your future policy will become live in 2022-23 and will continue as we are presently, uh, which have incorporated your simplifications in the interim? A lot depends on, on this house and how it wishes to cooperate. Um, obviously, I'm keen to get you know a, a bespoke policy, which um, may not suit every single person, but which encompasses as many people as possible uh, in a system which works for them. And uh, I will need, need the, the assistance of the committee and indeed this House uh, to deliver that. But I think it is something which we should all be working towards because we've ha we have a system that's been there for quite a while. Um, is it a bad system? No. Is it, is, is it a system that could be better? Yes. So, so let's get a better system. I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what support has this department provided local councils throughout the pandemic? Oh, the, the, the support that has been given to councils has been uh, substantial. Um, financially, in particular, it has been uh, very substantial support in terms of what we have done for um, waste management um, and supporting them uh, through, through funding. I haven't the figures on me just at this moment in time, but it runs into um, tens of millions of pounds of support uh, that has been provided through my department to councils. And I should add that councils in the last year, most of them have been able to have um, zero or very low rate increases uh, because they found themselves to be in a better financial position. And much of that was to do with the support they received from central government. Peter Weir, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister specifically obviously mentioned uh, waste management. Uh, can I ask the, the minister how recycling rates have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, it's been down slightly, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but we would hope to, to turn that around and arrest that. Um, we're considering continuing to give um, considerable support uh, to councils uh, for recycling. So. We have a package set aside of some £23 million uh, where uh, councils are installing um, new bins and, and collection uh, systems, uh, which will ensure that they get higher levels of recycling. I was uh, down in County Fermanagh uh, last week at the Drummy, where uh, they are claiming a lot more uh, materials, around 600 tonnes in the first year, even with COVID. Uh, of materials which, which went away from landfill uh, and have been recycled. And that's a saving of £60,000 to the people in the Fermanagh Oma Council area. So that type of work is going to continue to ensure that we can drive up recycling and ensure that our councils um, are motivated to do that. Call Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, as you will be aware, this autumn in GB, uh, drivers will no longer be required to do a test to drive with a trailer, and the B&E category will be automatically updated on GB license, drivers' licences. Have you had any discussions with the Infrastructure Minister about the possible removal of the trailer test to free up waiting lists for cars in HGV tests? 
No, I haven't, um, but it is something that, that, that I would support. Uh, I do think that um, people need a period of, of, of driving just a vehicle before they, they, they would be able to achieve driving with, the, with a trailer uh, in general and get a bit of experience in the roads. Uh, but I think most mature um, adults would be capable of, of driving with a trailer. Alan Chambers, supplementary. And, uh, would the minister, thank you, the Minister, for his answer. Uh, would the Minister know uh, what the legal position is in regard to insurance if GB drivers uh, want to drive in Northern Ireland, pull in a trailer? Well, I, I'm loath to say um, because I, I haven't had it, had, had it printed out and clarified for me, but I will seek to identify that. Um, it may well be the DFI Minister is best place to, to respond to you, but I will seek to, to identify that and uh, will raise the issue with uh, the DFI Minister uh, in the correspondence that the member raised in terms of um, us, to, us, us following suit and, and doing something similar. Call Paul Frew. Mr Speaker, can I congratulate the Minister for maxing out his questions at topical question time? He has now got to question number 10. Yeah. Uh, can I ask the Minister for Agriculture how agriculture in Northern Ireland can support increased availability of biomethane and hydrogen for use in transport and maybe even home heating uh, solutions going forward? Um, I thank the member for the question. I believe that Northern Ireland can lead the hydrogen revolution that needs to take place in order to ensure that we have renewable energy sources available, close to home, sustainable and future-proofed. And, uh, therefore, the work that, that we do in our department um, is to encourage these opportunities. So having 45 per cent of our energy produced from re renewable sources uh, gives us tremendous opportunities uh, to utilise that into hydrogen, uh, because much of that energy is not being generated at night um, currently, because the, the, the wind turbines are switched off. And, uh, therefore, um, Actually, utilising that at night uh, to produce hydrogen um, would, would be a, the use of a resource that already exists at no extra expense. So, so that makes entire logic. Um, f me taking farms down the route of more anaerobic digestion, um, and anaerobic digestion from, from slurries in the main, uh, is what I'd be pressing for, um, will lead to a circumstance where we're extracting methane, and that methane mixed with hydrogen can go into uh, our, our pipes and, and firmness and Phoenix are, are keen to use that. And we can feed our homes and heat our homes. And that all makes logical sense uh, for all of us in Northern Ireland in that we have fuel security, uh, pretty much food security, and uh, we ensure that we have that at a consistent price because we're not then um, out there to the variations of, of gas and, and oil prices in the world. Supplementary, Paul Frew. Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank the Minister for his very fulsome answer. Um, he'll be no stranger to North Antrim, of course, and the industries within North Antrim, not least uh, uh, Wright Bus uh, and their work around the hydrogen hub. Uh, how can the Minister ensure that his department can tap into industry in order that we fulfil our, our dreams and obligations around hydrogen going forward? I thank the member for that question, and I have engaged with Wright Bus, and would look forward to the opportunities not just in buses using hydrogen, but also um, our tractors, our diggers, uh, lorries, and I think eventually hydrogen is a much better solution than electric cars. I have to be very honest about it. Uh, we are importing a lot of materials which are mined in Africa, maybe not the most suitable circumstances, um, and, and I think that hydrogen uh, is, is a true renewable. And therefore, <clears throat> um, I will continue to work uh, with anybody who comes forward and meeting people on hydrogen next week and the following week. Um, but I'll continue to work with them. I'll continue to work with the Department for the Economy um, in driving this forward. And I'm working to actually try and draw down um, some of the e e ETS money, um, Emissions Trading Scheme money, uh, that has went to uh, Europe over the years, and see if we can draw that money down to invest in hydrogen and invest in reducing carbon, and invest in our planet's future and this country's future. Thank you, members. And that concludes this section of the question time. And members, please take your ease for a minute or two.